Hello and welcome to the third webinar in the series of webinars organized by the Erasmus Plus project LEC, Let Europe Know. LEC is a European project that deals with um, providing and improving information regarding adult education within and between adult education institutions towards other education providers and towards the general broader public. The LEC project is a follow-up to Infonet, which for many years was the information resource for adult education in Europe, providing news, articles, events and discussion and commentary. That function has since uh, then been partly at least replaced by EPALE, which is a European Commission initiative run by ECORIS in the UK. And currently a lot of the correspondent networks and a lot of the people who worked for uh, Infonet in the Times are also contributing to a higher or lesser extent to EPALE to provide the same sort of services and information. When Infonet was running, there was a general concern that um, the, the visibility of adult education, the visibility of the work that is being done in adult education is not always the best possible and it's also challenging to find ways to make it interesting, to engage an audience to be interested in the things that adult education is doing and the accomplishments and some of the challenges. And as a result, one project that came out of that was the LEC project, which is a further training of adult educators, people working with information and other people who are interested. We have built a curriculum which is going to be tested during this and next year. And part of that is also um, to offer webinars where we test some parts of the curriculum uh, in order to see if we are on the right track. The LEC project has identified five specific areas of interest that needs to be further developed. One of those is to reach and talk about uh, the unreachables, those who are most in need of adult education in Europe, but who are usually not represented and are also not reached by adult education provision, those who need it the most. And that is the backdrop, the reason for the webinar that we are running today on the 9th of May uh, for one hour, 9th of May 2017, I shall say for the recording. And to that end, Maurice de Graaf Graef has um, promised to give us a lecture and a presentation and a discussion uh, based on which um, we hope to further the understanding and the approach to uh, working with underrepresented groups, marginalized groups and excluded groups. Uh, this is a first webinar in a series of two. The idea is that um, we will do a follow-up webinar on the 23rd of May. We will come back with the details on that towards the end of this webinar and uh, hope that as many as possible of you are able to attend. This webinar is being recorded so that we have about almost 50 registrations for the webinar, but currently we have 24 in the room, which is a very good number. But a lot of people couldn't participate for various reasons, and they can then watch the recording. Uh, we have the map here so that you have been able to see from where we are, and it's a fairly wide distribution of participants from all over Europe, which is really nice to see. Um, during the webinar, we encourage you to ask questions, comments, and so on in the chat window, which is down here. The chat will be open throughout. I will so soon close off uh, my camera and give the floor to Maurice, but I will monitor the chat window and I will interrupt Maurice with your questions once you have them 
So your communication will be through the chat window. I see that Michael has also uh, said some additional information about Infonet, Elm and uh, LEC project, which is great. Please feel free to use this uh, webinar as a sharing space for your experiences, thoughts, ideas, comments. And uh, <coughs> our attempt is, we will try to make this as interactive as possible. Maurice, I give you the floor. Thank you so much, Johan. Good morning, everyone, and very nice that you have the opportunity to join us in this webinar of the LEC project in order to increase our competences in working for the field of adult education. My name is Maurice de Greef. I'm connected to the Vrije Universiteit Brussel, in English also Free University of Brussels, and to Maastricht University. One is in Belgium and the other one in the Netherlands. And together we are doing, uh, we're conducting a lot of research uh, concerning the impact of adult education and the possibility to reach the adult learners for adult education and therefore we had the opportunity now to present two studies which we conduct in the last three years also in cooperation with the Ealing Network where we were responsible for the research part. Um, as Johanny already um, uh, told you um, please interrupt me when necessary or when any questions occur is no problem at all so don't Keep your questions at the end of the presentation but it would be nice if some question pops up and you think um, you would like to um, ask something then you please be my guest and ask the question. Johanny I think that now is the moment that we can switch to the presentation. Are you able to do that? Good. And Johanny will um, see what's happening in the chat room. So if you have any question, ask it there. And Johanny will stop uh, um, my, will stop my presentation, and then I can answer your question. So um, for now, for the moment, that is uh, possible. What I'm trying to, um, what we as a university try to find out, how is this possible due to the fact to organize courses of adult education, especially for the people which we suppose need these kind of courses. Um, and if you look, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, um, the, the courses of adult education started a little bit at the end of the 70s, in the beginning of the 80s. Um, and during, uh, since 1980, we just most of the time use one PR uh, material, and that's paper-based. So we write a lot of brochures, we write a lot of uh, folders in order to attract people to join the courses of adult education. Sometimes it works, but most of the time it's not the most effective material. Here you can see a picture of an exhibition in The Hague concerning paper, showing that we, during our lifetime on this earth, write a lot of things on paper, and that paper-based work is one of the most, of was one of the most important things in the last years. And now it changes a little bit during, due to the fact that we have ICT um, um, things to use. Let's have a look. Um, hopefully you have the time and you give me the time to introduce some European citizens. This is the first one I would like to introduce, that's George. George is coming from um, Hungary and he uh, is an owner of a big farming company. He is 70 years old and still he can't work with ICT. He has a very serious problem with working with the computer. Um, he has to send an email, for example, to um, his stakeholders, which need the, to have the delivery of his farming company. So he has serious problems in his daily life. Second one is Estelle. Estelle is living in the UK. She's a nurse in an elderly home. She's 50 years, 58 years old, and Estelle's have some small problems with filling in a digital portfolio. When she has to, normally in earlier days, she can tell her colleague you what happened with the persons she took care of. But now there is a problem because she has to fill in a digital portfolio concerning all the things that happens um, with the specific clients. 
and she has to fill that in so that the other color you can find out what's happening with the client. Then we have Ajan. Ajan is living in the Netherlands. He's an owner of a supermarket. He's 40 years old and he's living in a neighborhood with lots of citizens with low um, with a low social economical status. And it's very difficult because these people don't know exactly what to do, for example, for going to um, a doctor or going to um, a community to fill in a form. And Ajan want to help them, but can't help them very clearly due to the fact that he's almost living now five years in the Netherlands. So the Dutch language is a little bit of a problem. Then we have Mary. Mary is coming from France. She's an employee in childcare. She's 30 years old. And every day she has to report to the parents what happened with the children. If they felt at ease, if they had some problems in, in, during the staying at the childcare or not. And every day she, uh, it occurs that it's for her very difficult to tell the parents and to say very clearly what she found out with the children. So in her daily work she has some problems. Then Agneta. Agneta is living in France. She, oh, excuse me, is living in Germany. She's born in Spain and she's 30, 40 years old and she's a psychologist, but she's very lonely in the, the last few months. Before she lived in Spain and she had her own family network and her own uh, friends there. And now she has to build that up in Germany again, but it's very difficult due to the fact that she has a very busy job and she have to take, has to take care for her children. So she don't know what to do, how to expand her social network. And the last one, Tim is living in Ireland. Tim is homeless since 10 years now. He's unemployed since 12 years. Due to the fact that he became unemployed, he had no money to buy a house or to rent a house. And now um, he had some problems. And also due to the fact that he's not in a social network anymore, and things changed in his near surroundings, he found out that his literacy skills became less and less, so he has low literacy skills for the moment. These six or seven people, um, which I introduced to you, um, these have a little bit of problem with um, uh, the social exclusion problem. And we see, if we look to the Eurostat figures, that almost a quarter of the European citizens are at risk of poverty. That's enormous. If you have four people in a row, then one felt himself or, or herself not at ease and so and being socially excluded in European society. And if you compare our European society to other countries and to other societies, then we think or we suppose that we are a very modern society and that most of the people feel at ease and feel that they are included in the daily environment. And now we found out that still a quarter, that's a lot of our European citizens, doesn't feel or don't feel at ease at all. If we look to the Netherlands, we can see that there is only one factor, that's the most important factor, that makes a gap or conduct a gap between people who feel at ease and people who don't feel at ease, or people who are at the uh, lower levels of the social inclusion at the higher levels of social inclusion and that's education. We in the Netherlands have a serious um, amount of people who are low skilled and high skilled and the gap between these parts is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and if you compare that to other parts of Europe we can see the same tendency that the gap from get quality of life between the low and high skilled is growing each year it's getting bigger and bigger. So we have to find out how we can close that gap a little bit more and how we can ensure that also low skilled people can be included in our society. Therefore, the Euro European Commission stated in 2010 that we have to do something about that and that was the Europe 2020 strategy in order to lift up 20 million people out of social exclusion and poverty. And they pointed out that these people most of them are the vulnerable adults or we can say seeing the seminar these are the people which we find out are sometimes unreachable for us concerning um, to in 
include them in the courses of adult education. These people often experience some illiteracy. If you look to the industrialized countries, then 22% of the citizens are supposed to be illiterate. Of course, that's an estimation, but still it's a lot. We see that 25% of today's 15 years old are inadequately skilled above 25. So that means that a quarter of a potential citizens who uh, starts to work already uh, doesn't have the skills to do his or her job properly. So it starts immediately when someone is getting into a job. And of course, the last years it became more and more that we can find out that migrants experience differences in life and also experienced um, serious problems in daily life due to the fact that it was difficult for us in some of our countries to get a new place for these migrants due to the fact that there were a lot of migrants. Besides this, we can see an upcoming tendency until 2040 of aging, aging our European society, society is getting older and older. And we found out that older people with health and financial problems can risk social exclusion. And if you look to the current studies, there you found out that um, a lot of older people are um, finding troubles with their health and also the fact how to uh, manage their financial things in daily life. So these are four kind of subgroups concerning the group vulnerable adults, which we can find out that experience problems in daily life in order to be socially included in our European society. And at a university, in the University of Brussels, but also in Maastricht University together, we found, we read a lot about, a lot about um, social inclusion. And due to the fact that the European Commission um, embraces the concept of social inclusion, we thought, okay, what is then social inclusion? So we tried to, to read, I think, about 200 articles, and we found out that what is now the basic foundation of social inclusion, to be included in our society, also if you are a vulnerable adult. We found out that social inclusion is a process in which citizens try to cope and control resources and services, have and connect to social relationships, feel included in the local area and take part in its activities. And especially number three, feeling included in the local area is a very important part of social inclusion but it's also most of the time the most difficult part of social inclusion. And due to the fact that our current study showed us that adult education is one of the most powerful tools to ensure that people feel included in the local area. Yes, I was just going to say. The kind of resources and services Wilfried, what you're asking for, are meant in this definition is the services um, um, to manage things in daily life. So for example, going to a doctor, um, going to a, um, the city hall to ask some um, things you need, for example, your driving license, etc., etc. So very basic services. And the resources are the resources to have a good life um, from the basic foundation. So to have a good house, to have enough money to buy the stuff you need, for example, to have an, and also um, the possibility to connect to other people. Is that an answer? Good. Great to hear. More questions about the concept? Okay, then I go on. So what we tried to find out with uh, um, the PhD we conducted in 2008 until uh, 2012 is to find out if adult education is a possible lever in order to ensure social inclusion and we and since then we we found out that courses of basic skills digital skills and especially also language skills are the three kind of courses who could be a lever in order to improve social inclusion um, for the moment we already investigated uh, more than uh, 6100 adult learners in eight countries and 100 communities by pre and post testing and we found out that after joining a course of adult education 40 to 60 percent of these 
um, adult learners got a better place in society or a better um, feeling of being socially included in society. So we found out that it worked. Going to the next slide. I can see that Alistair is typing something, but when the question occurs, I try to find an answer on it. Cultural factors such as a lack of interest in education among some social groups, especially youth. Yeah, we try to do that, Alistair. We try to incorporate also um, the daily factors in life, which are um, a kind of barriers in order to join adult education. And we found out that for several groups, it's very difficult to join adult education. It was not the use in urban areas what was really a problem, but what we found out is that especially adult autotone learners, so um, adult learners who are born in the country and especially in the neighborhood where the course took place, they are really embarrassed to start to learn and embarrassed to do something um, in order to find out if they can increase competencies for daily life. So, and we found out that sometimes it was very difficult to um, also empower the youth, but when they found out in um, the first two moments, in the first two contact moments, that there was an option to get a better life, they are really triggered to start a, tri um, a kind of a course. Yeah, sometimes, it, yeah, culture tends to be anti edit that's true and it's hard to break out of such cultures but then especially what we see in some regions that are families who are living together and for example in the Netherlands and in Belgium um, these families especially adults um, they get some nah, some social service and they get a little amount in order to survive during the day and then they will tell their children oh you don't have to go to work just do this and this and then you can live and it's also okay um, so that's that's really true. So it's hard to break through, but what helps is that if a housing company is going to rebuild a quarter, and then we found out that the culture tends to be anti-education, um, has been dropped due to the fact that people and families living together are going to live in different quarters and not next to each other. So if you cooperate with a stakeholder allowed, uh, like um, um, a housing company, then it will be okay. Um, this is the model of social inclusion we try to find out. Um, so people have to can do something for the individual individual thing and for the environment, and something functional and emotional. So, for example, um, they have to fill in a form at the doctor. They have to feel themselves at ease or safe in the neighborhood, or they would like to join a sports club or they would like to make new friends. So that's the total concept of social inclusion, an X between individual and environment and functional and emotional. This one I will skip and this also and I will come back to do. And I have a question for you and then I will get back to the other two slides. Which three groups are the most important target groups for your courses? It would be nice if you take the floor and give me some input, especially for the upcoming minutes of a seminar what you expect the most three important groups for your courses please anyone be free to tell me which course which groups you think are most important are typing so we wait a little minute in order to find out what's on the screen. And uh, as we're waiting for the first to come in, I would also say that those of you who are watching this recording are strongly encouraged to contemplate and consider the same thing, even if we cannot read it because we will not see it, because you will watch this at a later stage. But this is the start point of 
the process in, by which you understand how inclusion can and should work and what could be the role of adult education in that. Okay, I have a first answer of Shanit from Ireland. Johanny, is it possible um, that we can have an interaction with a voice? Because I want to ask a question and it would be nice if I got Yes, I can give audio uh, rights to participants. I cannot promise it works because it depends on their computers, if their uh, microphones are working correctly. But we will, for sure, we can give it a try. I will give microphone rights now and then anybody who wishes to use it needs to um, connect their microphone by clicking on the microphone icon on top of the screen. Uh, hopefully I say it right. Um, from Ireland, I have a question. Why do you um, refer to especially men's groups? If it's possible to give an answer on that, hopefully by microphone and otherwise by the chat room. I will repeat my question again for our contact persons from Ireland who are referring to men's groups. Why do you think that men's groups are the most important, one of the most important groups for your co courses? Is there a gap between reaching the men instead of the women, for example? She writes in the chat that she has no microphone working, so she will type the answer. Meanwhile, uh, I think you can take some of the other comments in the chat. Okay, from Popa, um, you're interested in all the people groups, for example, in all the people that that is a group which is more present in your in your area. Is it difficult to reach them? And that is a question for Popa. And he's he's typing too. Okay. So we can see that Popa is writing, okay. and that's okay. Um, we, I will, I will re retain. You will still have the microphone rights um, in the group. If you have a microphone, and if you are given a direct question by Maurice, you can try to answer by audio. But you need to connect, activate your microphone by clicking on the microphone icon on top of the screen in order to do so. And once you're done, you need to click it again to mute it so that we don't get circular. Okay, good. I wait for the ask, for the answer of Popa, and then I have a last one for Ulrika Knudsen, um, saying um, that you work with the folk high schools in a folk building, and the target groups are people with low education, immigrants with low or no literacy, and people that are far from the working full time and have low income. The last group is that also the people who are confronting with low skills. Um, competencies is that the same or is it also possible that these people who are far from the work in full time that they are, have higher skills? Yes, hello, Rika is here. Uh, yes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I would say that you could have both. It could be uh, with the low um, skills and also with higher skills, but many of them are like. Uh, they don't have any self-esteem, they feel very bad, and it's quite a lot of uh, job to uh, help them to get on the track and, uh, and to encourage okay. them to get into this. But this, because this could also uh, be a way of solving problems for them, because they could do, be working in a lower tempo and so on. Okay, that's nice, good to hear. I think that is a very interesting group, especially when you capture them in the course, and they will. We found out that they, this group, especially this group, um, can benefit the course of education yeah. a lot. What we found out, so it's a very, very good group to focus on. And then an answer on Shanit from Ireland. Thank you for also Ulrika. Thank you so much for the explanation. Thank you so much.
for she need the answer of the men's group we experience the reason why i ask that is that we experience that a lot in the european countries that is very difficult to um, trigger the men's group and what we try to do in the netherlands for example that was a very good um, um, uh, project we found out that a lot of men want to do something with their life and want to do something in order to earn a better money and wanted to start their own company so we worked together with the chamber of commerce and we started an, a language course in combination with the chamber of commerce and then it was really easy to attract men so hopefully that is an option to do um, and then also for popa you live in a rural area and young people go for work in western europe yes and then you find out that you have to attract the older people and the older people and that's now i'm going back to the presentation because the older people especially the elderly is one group who is really easy to trigger to join also see that Alistair has still an answer on the fact that uh, men are more unreachable than women but it would be interesting in hearing the figures and if I can I can underline it with the figures that normally in the courses which we um, conducted and which we also measured in our studies we found out that 60 until 70 percent of um, uh, the participants are women so that's a lot of more I go back to the presentation. Two slides back. Yeah. What is most important to attract, what we found out, what is most important to attract the unreachable, is that we that you have to um, find out what their language is, what is for their important to do. So you have to connect the contents to the live domains. For example, we found out that a lot of persons really have difficulties with doing the financial stuff or have difficulties with doing the digital stuff and that is not something to be ashamed of and all, also we found out that some people um, have difficulties in um, reading for their own children that's a little bit more to be ashamed of if you're born in your own country um, and also we found out that sometimes in working in the neighborhood of doing volunteer work there they found out that they don't have enough competences so that's the daily language but then what is more what was more important still is that we found out that people have serious problems to visit a doctor or a hospital and also have serious problems to communicate at war, work so we found out that there are six live domains um, who are important and who can be which can be connected to courses of adult education so the financial matters the digital language the daily language family language healthy language and working language and the yellow part is really internal you can do that by yourself and the red part you can see that's in uh, communication with others outside and another thing is that we found out that in uh, especially the western countries we are very often to uh, say that adult learners are one group and we have high skilled of high skilled or low skilled people um, but sometimes we have low people with a high proficiency of literacy and a low proficiency of literacy and you have to divide these groups because they have different needs in daily life then now i come to the basic question how to reach them we conducted two studies and the first one was of the lnet network that was the network of um um, in order to find out which good practices are there concerning uh, literacy or concerning to fight literacy in Europe and we conducted a research among 42 European partners stakeholders in 21 countries and we asked them in the first um, quantitative research and quantitative questionnaire okay if you have to do something concerning awareness raising for literacy and something to attract people how are you doing dealing with this and what is then important after this part we um, traced seven good practices and we organized seven um, focus group settings in these countries together with the important stakeholders in order to find out what the most important things are in order to increase awareness raising for the course of adult education and in order to attract uh, participants the unreachables but also besides that new stakeholders due to the fact that we found out 
that the field of adult education is most of the time really um, a little bit on itself and it's very difficult to connect to policy makers, to decision makers and to other stakeholders like housing companies, welfare organizations or um, libraries. We found out that these are the most important seven things in order to increase awareness raising and to attract learners and other stakeholders. So what I want to do now is to step to these seven parts and with everything I want to or every element I want to underline that element with um, um, a kind of an, uh, a quotation of a stakeholder. And then I go to my second question. The first one is what often miss in developing courses of adult education is a strategic planning um, and that you incorporate the local context. For example, one um, organization, I thought it was from Sweden, told us that, that with this quotation that it is very um, important to know what the favorite activity of the parents and the children uh, is in order to develop your own course. Your course should be appointed including the favorite activity of the potential learners. For example, they found out that only 9%, 8% was just um, reading and it was story time. Only 4% said that reading and storytelling was um, a favorite activity. So, um, and they also found out that only 2% of the parents read to the smallest age group. So if you only say we are going to start up a course of reading your children, then it's prob probably difficult to reach them, but you have it make it better. So um, you, for example, can formulate how to get a better spare time with your children and then incorporates the reading part during the course. But don't start the PR with saying that you will help parents to read. Don't focus on that, but focus on what these parents can do with the children after following the course, what the benefit is for them. The second thing was a branding and reputation and a kind of a credibility. Um, we often find out that adult education is a very good field and a very enthusiastic field with a lot of good, hard-working professionals. But there is a little bit of kind of an idealistic thing about it that people thinks that, think that it is good to take care of the learners. But someone, you have to be, sometimes, you have to be a little bit a stronger person. For example, a stronger person who can say and who can urge other persons to go to the course of adult education. For example, an employer, um, which they have a personal contact with, can directly point out that people have to join the course. We tried that in the Netherlands because it was very difficult to um, uh, reach companies for courses of, of literacy. We made um, um, uh, agreements with several companies and we told them that the management board should direct some persons and give them the chance to find out if they can study literacy. And then it worked because it was for them, for the employee, it was a strong person that the employer itself asked them to do something extra for the company and to start the course of literacy. Go to number three. If there are any questions in between, ask them by the chat. The timing. The synergy of interests and events. For example, we found out that in Hungary, there was a quotation like this. In Hungary, and there's a huge event each year, that's the National Day of the Folk Tales. There's a conference on it, and in a lot of towns and villages connecting to schools. One of the experts of the stakeholder in Hungary told us that this was the best day to, found, to start up a course of literacy connected to the folk tales because it is embraced in Hungary that everyone can read a folktale or can tell a folktale to others and to the children. The fourth thing is partnerships. Try to um, combine two stakeholders in different fields. What they did here, for example, um, is that they uh, tried to ask pediatricians to do some redirecting um, work in order when they found out that people have low skills or have low competencies for the daily life and they found that out in the conversation with this potential learner then the pediatrician redirects this person to a course.
the innovativeness and the risk taking that was a really nice example for Sweden what they did there is that there was a problem concerning reading and concerning the redirection of people getting into courses so they worked together with the McDonald's and with the McDonald's they asked the McDonald's if you order a happy meal or order another meal is it possible not to give the toy but to give a book and also in, in um, with that book hopefully more information about the importance of reading and about the importance of following courses. This wasn't a very difficult effort to start up, but it worked really well, um, unless that's what they told us. And Alistair is typing, when, and when the question is there, I will answer it. And also the quality of the message and the messenger is very important. Um, and what, um, yeah, it's nice idea, Alice, <laughs> a book with a happy meal. But it worked, it really worked in Sweden, they told us, or in that region. So what we found out, that sometimes when you work together with ambassadors, these ambassadors um, um, tried to um, ask potential learners to join courses in a way that they found out that they feel themselves a little bit pathetic. But these people shouldn't be mentioned as pathetic or having a problem but just um, tell them that there are so many opportunities in life and that they are um, um, and that they can be um, can have an opportunity to get a better life and more chances if they do that kind of course the last one and that was leadership and teamwork and that's especially support for ambassadors we also found out in the last study and that i will present that's only one slide that the ambassadors are the most important, um, um, uh, um, how do you say that, supportive professionals or volunteers for your project. This is an example from Croatia. She's also working on different fields, projects involved with child health, child education and all that. So the community is already used to know her face, to her meaning on everything, but she did a lot of human humanitarian actions to save money to some very good things and she included also radio media tv newspaper and everything so in croatia there was one woman who was really a good ambassador and was in the media and who could really work well for um, um, the redirection of courses okay sure i shouldn't move anymore okay sorry should be very still good and I'm going to the second question. It would be nice to know from you all who is, if you organize a course of adult education, your most important ambassador for your course. Please type the answer or just use the microphone and hopefully we will get some nice answers on this question. Who is your most important ambassador for a course of adult education? Okay, the answers are coming. Former attendance, really good, Anders. Voluntary organizations. My own fields, I have a question for you. You tell me that you work with voluntary organizations, their employees encourage their learners. Can you explain okay. to me how you're doing that? And also for the other okay. European uh, We're a study centre, so so a lot of the funding that we get we direct directly to our member organizations that they're all voluntary NGOs. And they they have a certain amount uh, amount of hours to use for training with their volunteers every year. And we also train, we train their trainers, but some of our courses attract volunteers as well. So, so this is how we work. Oh. So there is a professional um, training behind yes, it. Yes, but we're a non-formal uh, provider, so, so we, don't, um, we don't give sort of any credentials to go, to go with the training. Of course, we have our own diplomas and so on, but, uh, but we just want want to ensure that the volunteers also get good 
quality educational opportunities. We also support um, study circles, financially and pedagogically. So, okay, so, so there's a basic foundation for them in order to increase the competence to work as a volunteer but they for can your also, organization. A lot of the courses that they organize uh, because we have, for example, um, disability organizations. So, so the study circles will be about about coping, about peer support, or we have organizations that do crafts and home economics. So they so they give crafts and cookery courses, for example, to the public. So so they and of course mm -hmm. then we have we have an organization like the Red Cross who teaches. First aid skills, so so it varies a lot. Some of what what's typical to all of the organisations is that they will have some basic volunteering courses or courses on how to manage your local association, but otherwise, or how to use social media, for example. But otherwise, the courses vary a great deal according to uh, the organisation's mission. If it's to increase well uh, family welfare, they will have okay. all sorts of family courses, parenting courses, and things like that. So, so we just uh, help them with the quality. That's very nice. Very nice that you give a kind of good basic foundation um, to give them a, a good competence in order to do their work. Really nice. Thank you so much, Marion, for your contribution. And I have a question also for um, uh, Ellen, Ellen DeWitt. We know each other. Hopefully your microphone is working, Ellen. Ellen DeWitt. Does your microphone work? Would be so nice. No, that's a pity. Now then I will, <laughs> I will explain what you told by chat. In, um, you are working in a regional center of adult education. They have Taal ambassadors. Taal is a Dutch word, of course, for language, and they are the ambassadors um, who already follow the course in language and then um, um, try to um, explain to other potential learners which they know, who they know, um, what the benefit of, of a course is, and try to attract them to um, um, to the new courses. And they uh, they also get trainings for that. So that's in the Netherlands, a re really good network also supporting Sitting ABC. Um, to organize um, um, the competencies of uh, Tao ambassadors. And what was also nice that Wilfried put in in Austria a movie in the cinema some two or three years ago presenting examples of adults that had improved their literacy skills. Uh, Wilfried, that trailer is still available. Does your microphone work? Yes, it is. Wonderful. That's the answer. Then I'm going to the um, last part. Oh, no, I have one more question, and I, I don't know if I pronounced the name pretty well. That's Gale Gauthier. Hopefully, um, I pronounce it very well. You say that, that you have current participants in order um, to get of, to reach new participants. Is your microphone working? Gail or Gale Gauthier? Yeah, maybe I come and I'll see that Johanny is telling me that I have 10 minutes. Then I hopefully come back to the next webinar yeah, because I want to show you a last part. I go back to the presentation. Thank you all for your contributions. It's very worthy. What we did now, what we try to do, and I see that the slide is not totally on it, but that we developed a four step model how to know what the adults learners need to learn. We try when we develop a course. Um, uh, that we specify the daily life environment of the learners. What is their healthy language? What do they need from the care, field of care? What is their working language? Are there, um, uh, do they have a job? Or are we pointing on people who don't have a job? What is their family circumstances? Do they uh, live in neighborhoods where, where they only are focused on their own family or not? And what do they, um, how is their daily life living? Are they often divorced or are they married do they have children etc what is their financial language what can they are they able to manage their own finances or not 
How are the digital skills of the people? And what are they doing in daily life? Are they often in the, for example, in the neighborhood center? Or do they sport a lot of not? Now, and then we found out in the second step what the specific interests of these people are on these live domains. And in the third step, we try to just write very shortly because this is not more than just one A4 um, in which places are they active in these live domains. So for example, we have to go to primary schools or we have to go to hospitals or we have to go to pediatricians. And the last question that's out here, which stakeholder do I connect to them? So these is the four, are the four important questions which you have to answer by reaching the unreachables. And then the last slide, you see that my number skills are not so good because here you have to find out one, two, three, four, five instead of five times a one. There are five most important um, uh, things or PR materials to use. We found out in a uh, qualitative research which we conduct that the most important and most effective PR material is mouth to mouth. Of course, it is good that you have a brochure, but that's a kind of a form, a brochure or a flyer. But mouth to mouth was the most important thing. The second thing what we found out is to engage stakeholders to your organization of adult education for redirecting um, uh, potential learners to your courses. For example, the um, doctor, for example, someone at the city hall, for example, um, someone, a volunteer in the neighborhood center, or someone at a sports center. The third one is that you go to the meeting places in the local environment and try to find out what you can do. Also, a little bit on TV, radio, radio or media, like an example of Wilfried Fry told us by giving the link what they did in Austria. And a last one, what we found out um, is important, that you have ambassadors to do the work for you, and especially one who are already experienced in following courses. These five, if you have a mixture of these five PR materials, you, most of the time, you will get the minimum of, start, um, of adult learners, which is needed to start a course of adult education. Then the last question, which I want to ask you, if you look to what you did already the last years in organizing a course of adult education, which PR material did not work at all? Please give your answer in the chat. And Johanny, for the procedure, I will um, look to these answers and then I will have, I just need one more minute to end the presentation. Yes, of course. And then after that, we will move back to the first room where the chat window is bigger and we will give final practical information about the next steps. Okay, the answers are coming. Just waiting. Great. <laughs> That's a nice answer, Wilfred. So you did an evaluation of a project where they tried to attract female learners at youth centers where mainly male youngsters hang around. Yeah. So <laughs> Being around in the surroundings, yeah, where the target group does not show up is not the best thing ever. So it's very good to know which important surrounding or which important place you have to visit getting the target group. This is a really nice example. Opa, ambassadors, you couldn't find anyone, 
that's really a pity because most of the time my experience is that it is possible to find ambassadors but also because i still can remember that it was especially especially elderly people try to found to cooperate with um if it's possible in your surroundings with elderly homes because in most elderly homes there are also some high skilled elderly who really want to do something in uh, their life so are still interested to do something and we found out in the western countries that it's possible to attract them marion fields say that course advertisements that are included in a newsletter that's true they are too general not so easy to notice and most especially if you look to low-skilled people, it's difficult for them to read sometimes. I wait for Ellen. And then I go on with the last part. It took me almost four years and I have three ambassadors. So hold on. <laughs> so, Opa, it really works. You will get ambassadors, but only it takes sometimes a while. But <laughs> okay, good. Good. It works. You, you, it's, sometimes it's hard to get ambassadors, but if you have one, then it works. Now I go to the last minute of the presentation. Thank you for the contributions. Of um, uh, It's really nice. What I think is that the possible future role for adult education centers, that they will be a multifunctional center. And this is the um, Olympic Stadium of Beijing. I was there once and it's really a nice thing. And it gave me the experience of being a multifunctional center. And there you see this picture but then in order to reach this the teacher has to network with stakeholders he is most of the time in the informal learning center learning setting or formal learning setting at the center of it but he has to be connected to the meetings places of the inhabitants in order to find the inhabitants and to attract the citizens to the courses of adult education and then the difficulty is that besides the normal offer you are doing in your course of adult education, you have to create possibilities for education on demand based on the different live domains I explained. Because we really found out that in um, Western counties it works when you have more, when you use these live domains and you connect that to adult education, it's, it works. And you have to make the results and its positive impact visible. What I didn't do in this presentation is that I showed you how we make decision makers aware of the fact that it works. Maybe that's an option for um, a second webinar. But we showed the decision makers what the impact is and also to the participants themselves all the time. And at last, you have to create a durable enthusiasm among the inhabitants, decision makers and stakeholders by showing the benefits and the what's in it for them. And then I, can th I think that um, we still um, um, have the opportunity to make a reality of the fairy tale of Hans Christian Andersen, then also low skilled people um, have the opportunity to be reached in courses of adult education and uh, can become, um, get a better life, better included in, in Europe, and hopefully instead of the ugly duckling becomes a swan. And the last thing what I want to say is that the report of the Illinet study I already to send it to your honey, so maybe it's good, your honey, that you send that report to everyone where you can find out the study results concerning the most important parts of yes. um, getting awareness for adult education. That's it. Okay, everybody. Um, that rounds up the one hour long webinar that has been conducted today regarding how to reach the unreachables in adult education. And you are uh, welcome and invited to keep uh, the comments going in the chat window. And uh, before I close the recording, I want to say that there will be a follow-up webinar, a part two, if you wish, of this one on the 23rd of May, all at the same time with the same address. All those who have registered for this webinar will get uh, a reminder with a link to that. You will get a link to the report Maurice report, uh, mentioned and also a reminding uh, link to the presentation that Maurice has given you here today. It is available on SlideShare so that you can see also the number four, some of those that didn't show up on the screen uh, today because um, 
Adobe Connect constricted it a little bit. And in order for uh, us to have the second webinar, the follow-up webinar, as work-oriented as possible, Maurice has, has uh, produced a set of issues and questions and preparations, an assignment task, if you wish. I will send that uh, in the email to all of you, together with a link to the, with the recording of this webinar and all the other materials. It is not mandatory. You do not have to do that assignment. But the next webinar is more based on discussions in the group and less on the presentation as such. If there are needs for clarifications uh, and further questions to Maurice having that when you have read the report, of course, there is time for that. And so he can pre prepare a short intervention. But a lot of that time in uh, the next webinar will be concerning the assignments, the, the issues where you are asked to, to look at your own practices, your own work, your own challenges, and present models of either your ways of working with it, or how you would want to work with it, or why you cannot work with it. So that's going to be the main thrust of the next webinar. Now I'm going to close the recording.